problem. So now I would like to invite our two um, discussants. Um, first, uh, uh, Dr. Vinod Reiner. He's a scientist and he's been very much engaged uh, in the people science movement in India. So,
we are flooded, we are like boats in a flood or in a water of science and technology. But this science and technology that in which we are emerged, emerging or submerged, I don't know what, all three, is like that environment of the primitive man where we take it for granted. All our cell phones, all our laptops, all our recording equipment, all our lights, all our everything. But when something happens to that, we're like that primitive man we don't understand. Whether it's a Fukushima, whether it's a Minamata, whether it's a Bhopal, or whether it is 80 cases that we documented in a book for the dispossessed victims of development of Asia from 11 Asian countries, 500 page book. And we are like those primitive people when that happens. So who do we turn to? Like the primitive human whom did he or she turn to? To the primitive priest. Tell us what to do. There is so much rain. So who are our priests today? They are scientists, doctors, technologists. And we turn to them and say, what should we do? Should we live there? Should we eat food? Should we drink that water? What do we do? Because we're helpless. We're completely let in. And these new priests are a breed of scientists, technologists. And what are the, their temples today? Their temples today are not transparent democratic institutions which we used to call the university as the institution of knowledge. I'm sorry to say that most for all, most of us, and we're sitting in a university, university is a remnant of that uh, institution of knowledge. The institutions of knowledge today are corporations. The knowledge that is determining us every day, the sea which is determining how we flow, is today with corporations. That knowledge which for centuries was a common, that knowledge we as physicists when we used to write papers would be circulated for the whole community to see and read, are crafted by economic and trade laws to say that this is one of the this is not the public domain. This is secret. And we invoke IPR laws. I often say that there was a time when we would be writing for the general public about science. Today scientists are sitting with lawyers to file patents to see how you can keep that information from the public. Don't put it in the public domain. You don't need a better example. You don't have to go to nuclear sequence, which is the ultimate secret world of knowledge. Coca-Cola, for God's sake, has been with us for 100 years in determining how we live. But the formula of Coca-Cola is a secret forever since it was done. It's not available for market. We don't know what is in Coca-Cola because the formula is secret. So secrecy is the basis of capital trust. So therefore, knowledge of the commons is not available to us. And therefore, when we are helpless, like in Fukushima, what uh, Ohashi san graphically described, how many micro shivers? What is the shiver? What is the limit of micro shiver? Can they go there or can they not go there? And the government tells you, you can go during the daytime, but nighttime you come back. But why? What, what sense does it make? Are we any different from that primitive human being? This modernized element we are today. I don't think we are. And this is why the control of the government, of the corporations and the new police has changed science into not an ally, but through a capitalist domination based on marketing and profits into a system of control. Where the most educated people like us have very little when such crisis comes and we're totally dependent, completely helpless. Sitting here will make feel nice, but Fukushima, look at it. Sensible people, clever people, in 
intelligent people, educated people, the cow has to be taken to slaughter. You know the picture says. Why? Because this cow's milk may be harmful and the cow has to be slaughtered. They didn't just slaughter cows. Because slaughtering requires transportation. They let the cows in their cow sheds die of hunger. And probably Mahajisan didn't show us the picture because it's too gruesome. But the carcasses of the cow who died from hunger because it was like to die, because the government said, but that's the only option you have. And the farmer crying, saying his, his or her cow's being happening like that. So I think therefore each of these incidents in Fukushima vividly tells you that Japan is one of the most advanced societies in this world. It's also a very humane society in many ways. It doesn't have the aggressiveness of the US. It still goes. It, it, there's so much boy and aragata daimasta in that society. But yet, that society, the people of that society, can be made to look like nothing but primitive human beings. The question therefore is, and that's the second paper that we had, that's very, very, very reflective. Should we stop science? I don't think that's an option. That's not an option. Because given the human mind, which is by nature cognitive, human mind has created what we call science and technology out of the nature of what we are. And I don't therefore think that we have an option to tell governments or corporations stop science. But there was at one point of time a notion to which uh, but Einstein was a very, very strong votary of socializing science, science and socialism. And in 1920s, started as a movement of science can be institutionalized for the larger public good without be becoming secretive, be without being monopolized, and without its ill effects, which are seen when it becomes a system of control. I think that's still an option. In India, we call it the people science movement. Why you don't work for the institutions of the government? Why you work with farmers, women's groups, ecological groups, and use your knowledge directly with the, their knowledge, recognizing that their knowledge of society, for commons, for the betterment of society, of the larger world. That's an option. But how many university scientists are willing to that. How many economists are willing to do that? It's not only scientists. But what we heard before this session, our women, they are scientists. They are scientists. They are trying to craft their technologies, weaving, with water. That's two sides. But we have to recognize first that, that that's also science. And that's an alternative. To which the university science, the institutional science must link up. I would like to believe that in many societies, particularly in China, it will have to be done very fast. It will have to be done very fast. It cannot remain as little examples here and there. It cannot remain as islands here and there. It has to shape the future governance systems, production systems, and living systems. And I cannot, while I as I said, as a scientist, I'm attracted to Marx because of dialectical materialism, which I find is a very, very powerful way of uh, making sense of knowledge, historical materialism. But at the same time, the very brief glimmerings of Gandhi, who thought that the only way to have a humane society was to have local governance, local production, and an education system which was geared to that. And the three, when they come together, was the only way to have a human society. Along with dialectical materialism of trying to synthesize Gandhian and Marxian views at a level of thought are an alternative. And in practice, 
many things that we have heard here from reconstruction and and we went here and the people signed the movement that we tried to do in India, which is something like 400,000 members, are large alternate use to both thought and practice, the theory and practice, what we heard about from the Schumacher College yesterday. And I would like to say that hearing both these presentations, we need as intellectuals, as academicians, as activists, as farmers, to, dis to decide that we will bend ourselves together into a knowledge commons and a knowledge commons which is limited. I would like to end just by saying, Tolstoy wrote a story many years ago, you might have read. He said, how much land does a man, man, man need? The story was, a king told a man, I will give you as much land, you run around and whatever running you do in circles will be your land. The man did not believe. He kept on running, he kept on running to grab more and more land and he fell down dead. So even though he covered that, this is a top story story, how much land does a man need? The question is, how much energy does a man need? Do we want to have energy that we kill ourselves by nuclear explosions, by uh, uh, carbon emissions, and then we, we feel that we have gained enough, but we are dead by that time? I think we need to reflect on that in Fukushima. Yes, well, thank you very much.